So let's continue our discussion on glycoproteins, the process of protein glycosylation. So when we modify proteins by adding carbohydrates to them, we basically change their properties and modify their functions to basically give them the ability to carry out a certain type of process. So inside our body, we have many different types of glycoproteins and generally speaking, glycoproteins have a wide range of functions. So what I'd like to do in this lecture is focus on several important glycoproteins that exist inside our body and see how by adding the sugar component onto the protein, we give the protein the ability to carry out some specific type of process. Now, at the end of the lecture, I'd also like to discuss an example of a disease known as the eye cell disease that exists in humans that basically demonstrates the importance of protein glycosylation. So let's begin by discussing a category of glycoproteins known as mucins. Now, mucins, as we'll see in just a moment, are the major constituents, the major components of the mucous membranes that exist inside our body. So the mucous membranes can be found in the nasal cavity, in our air passageways, the bronchioles, and so forth. Now, mucins are basically these heavily glycosylated proteins that are produced and released by the epithelial tissue, the epithelial cells of our body. Now, heavily glycosylated basically means there are many oligosaccharides, many sugar molecules found attached onto these proteins. The reason, the question is why? Well, if we examine the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence of the protein, we'll find a high density, a high number of serine and threonine residues. And it's these two residues that are basically needed to produce the O-glycosidic bonds between the protein and the sugar molecules. So because mucins contain a high number of threonine and serine residues, they are heavily glycosylated with the O-glycosidic linkages. Now, although most mucins are actually produced by the cells and released into the extracellular matrix, some of these mucins actually remain attached onto the cell membrane, and this is what is shown in this diagram. So we have the cell membrane, we have this hydrophobic section of the protein shown in brown, and this is the rest of that protein and these are basically the oligosaccharides and we have many of these oligosaccharides as shown. So what exactly is the function of mucins? Well, because mucins are part of the mucous membrane and the mucous membrane basically acts to lubricate and protect our body from pathogenic agents, what that means is these individual mucins have to be able to carry out that specific function. Now, how exactly does it carry out the function of lubrication? Well, basically, these red oligosaccharides contain modified sugar molecules that contain negative charges. And these negative charges attract water molecules, which are polar molecules. And so, as a result of those charges, we're basically going to have many of these water molecules, which are basically going to surround this entire mucin molecule. And as a result, that basically gives the addition of these sugar molecules, gives the mucins, these proteins, the ability to actually absorb water. And that's exactly what gives the mucous membranes the ability to lubricate those epithelial cells. On top of that, these carbohydrates are very sticky and they can basically trap pathogenic and infectious agents. And so that means the mucins that form the mucus barriers basically have the ability to lubricate and protect epithelial tissue. Now, let's move on to the second type of glycoprotein that we'll find inside our body, and this is known as erythropoietin or EPO. Now, erythropoietin is a glycoprotein, and the protein component basically consists of an amino acid sequence of 165 amino acids. And four of these amino acids are actually glycosylated. So 
three of these amino acids are asparagine amino acids and that means we have the N glycosidic bonds and one of these amino acids is the serine amino acid and that means we have the O glycosidic bond. And so this brown section, which actually looks like a bunny, this brown section is the protein component of erythropoietin. And these are these four oligosaccharides, which are bound onto these four different amino acids. Three of them are asparag three of them are asparagine, and one of them is the serine. Now, what exactly is the function of erythropoietin? Well, erythropoietin is basically a glycoprotein that is produced by special cells found inside our kidneys. And these glycoproteins are released into the blood plasma and they act as hormones. They basically bind onto special precursor cells and they stimulate the cells to basically produce erythrocytes, red blood cells. Now, the reason we essentially add these sugar molecules onto the protein component is to basically increase the stability of erythropoietin within the blood plasma. And this decreases the likelihood that the kidneys are going to remove this hormone from the blood plasma. So uh, glycosylation of erythropoietin helps to stabilize this structure in the blood plasma and what that means is it decreases the likelihood that the kidneys are going to remove this protein, the glycoprotein, from the blood plasma. That means this glycoprotein can basically stimulate the production of red blood cells. Now, erythropoietin is not the only glycoprotein that acts as a hormone inside our body. We have many other examples of glycoproteins that act as hormones. For instance, we have the thyroid stimulating hormone that is a glycoprotein. We have the human chorionic gonadotropin that also acts as a hormone and is a glycoprotein. We have the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone which are also examples of glycoproteins that act as hormones. Now let's move on to tissue factor and antibodies. So we're not going to go into detail into these two glycoproteins because we actually focused on them in detail previously. So tissue factor is a glycoprotein that is basically exposed when the blood vessels in our cardiovascular system experience some type of trauma. And these glycoproteins, <clears throat> The tissue factor is found on the membrane of epithelial cells. And once the tissue factor, the glycoprotein, is exposed, it initiates the extrinsic pathway of the blood clotting cascade. It basically initiates the formation of blood clots, the coagulation process. Now, antibodies are also glycoproteins which basically are found floating within our blood plasma and we have many different types of antibodies. So, what these immunoglobulins do is basically they bind onto pathogenic or infectious antigens and they initiate some type of immune defense response that ultimately kills off that infecting agent. So, it protects our body from these different types of infectious agents. So we see that glycoproteins have a wide range of functionality. So some glycoproteins basically absorb water and act as lubricants and also protect our body from infectious agents and, uh, and antibodies also carry out the function of protecting our body. We see that others play a role in the blood clotting cascade and basically creating these blood clots and initiating the coagulation process. Other glycoproteins act as hormones and we have many many other examples of glycoproteins. Now the final thing I'd like to discuss in this lecture is this disease we call the eye cell disease also known as mucolipidosis 2 which is basically a lysosomal storage disease. So what exactly does that mean? Well inside our normal cells we basically have an organelle known as a lysosome. 
And inside the lysosome, we have these digestive enzymes, these hydrolytic enzymes. And what they do is they basically recycle and break down the different types of byproducts which are produced inside the cells. So they break down things like large carbohydrates and glycose aminoglycans and glycolipids and all this takes place inside the lysosomes. Now, these hydrolytic enzymes under normal conditions are produced inside the ER, then modified inside the Golgi apparatus, and then they end up inside the lysosome. So, how this process takes place is in the following way. So, the ribosomes found on the rough ER basically synthesize these hydrolytic enzymes. And once synthesized, they are basically modified in some way by adding the N-glycosidic linkages. And then those uh, hydrolytic enzymes are transferred into this membranous sac known as the Golgi apparatus. And as they move within the Golgi apparatus, a special enzyme known as Phosphotransferase basically adds a phosphoryl group onto the mannose sugar found on the hydrolytic enzyme and that produces the mannose 6-phosphate. Now, the special thing about this modified sugar molecule found on the hydrolytic enzymes is that it is the marker. It basically dictates exactly where the hydrolytic enzyme will actually end up. So it's the mannose 6-phosphate that acts as the marker that basically is used to direct the hydrolytic enzymes to the lysosomes. And so normally, if this process takes place correctly and the hydrolytic enzymes are actually properly phosphorylated via this process, only then will they actually end up in the lysosomes and only then will the lysosomes actually be able to carry out their process. Now, what happens in individuals that have the eye cell disease? Well, in individuals with the eye cell disease, this phosphotransferase cannot actually create the mannose 6-phosphate. So what happens is, when the hydrolytic enzymes end up inside the Golgi apparatus, that mannose sugar remains unmodified. And so what that means is, the protein glycosylation process does not take place correctly. And because we have the unmodified mannose, because we don't have the mannose 6-phosphate, those hydrolytic enzymes do not actually know that they should go into the lysosome. And so what happens in an individual with the eye cell disease is these hydrolytic, enzyme, basic, hydrolytic enzymes basically end up being transported out of the cell. And so in individuals with the eye cell disease will have a high concentration of these hydrolytic enzymes in our blood plasma and the lysosomes are going to be deficient in these hydrolytic enzymes and what happens if we don't have the hydrolytic enzymes inside the lysosomes that means we're going to have an accumulation of all these different types of byproducts inside the lysosomes so things like glycolipids and large carbohydrates and glycose aminoglycans will not be able to be broken down because of the absence of these hydrolytic enzymes and that can lead to many, many negative problems inside our cells and inside our body. So we see that the process of protein glycosylation is very important because it doesn't only modify the functionality of proteins, it also actually tells the proteins where to actually go, as in this particular case. So we see that the mannose 6-phosphate is the marker that is used to basically direct these digestive enzymes, the hydrolytic enzymes, to their, uh, to their correct location, to the lysosomes of the cell.